Good morning, all. It's all right. The social hour is after the service, not before, but anyway. We'll wait. A couple more minutes. Yeah. Welcome all. Good morning. My name is uh, Dan Winton, and I am a, the lay minister for today. Uh, Mary Cyphers, our minister, is on well-deserved uh, vacation. And as is customary, we have our lay members who step up and uh, offer their sermons. And uh, I, it was my pleasure to be the lay leader today. Uh, one introduction uh, for those who don't know her, my wife Kathy is here. Right there. Also, um, in terms of concerns, uh, Jeff Raccoon told me that Bob Underwood fell, and uh, he's on the mend, uh, but he looks like he's been in a good bar fight, so our prayers are with, are with Bob. In terms of announcements, note that in the bulletin, the committee meetings start this month with the trustees meeting tomorrow evening and the council of deacons meeting during this month. Also, if you could take a look at the save the date on the inside portion of the bulletin in terms of what is going on in our church. So, announcements. Yes. And thank you, Dan, for being the last in our summer series of our lay ministers. We don't even have to bribe them or twist an arm. They step up and say, we have something we'd like to say. So, Dan has been serving for this ch this church for so many years and most recently as one of our deacons so thanks to thank you very much to dan so i am becky adams co-chair of the deacons and one month from now is our church retreat it is hard to believe that september 14th through 16th is around the corner um, jesus went away for 40 days we only get 40 hours but i'm asking all of you to sign up if you can come you don't need to pay until september 1st but it's a wonderful resort down in Carlsbad, and we do have to start letting some of these rooms go. So it's a, a lovely, it's an incredibly intriguing theme, if you ask me, because it's about our spiritual types and the importance that, um, that every spiritual type has in this church. And so this is also an open invitation to those of you who have been visiting us. And, you know, we are a community church where we, we welcome you all, and we want to be part of your life and part of your spiritual journey. So you don't need to be a member of this church to come to this retreat. Um, you can stay in your room at, in between the sessions if you want and not talk to any of us, or you can just enjoy being with us and, and getting to know us better. But you're all welcome to come to this retreat. So you can either talk to me, I'm Becky Adams. There's Debbie Olderwage's phone number on in the um, bulletin. And we have the sign-up sheet out on the patio. So. If you're intrigued like I am, it's like a Myers-Briggs of your spiritual personality. So anyway, looking forward to Mary's um, uh, retreat on that. Also, please be with us next Sunday out on the courtyard. She's not here today, but she said she's going to be here. We are celebrating a very special birthday for a very special lady, Barbara Sawyer. So um, that will be in the courtyard next Sunday, and we will have a, a wonderful time then. And thank you very much, and welcome to all of you. Thank you, Becky. Any other announcements? Thank you. We will continue now with our service.
verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. And all are welcome at Community Church. From Psalm 18, verses 1 to 3. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my champion. My God, my rock, in whom I find shelter. My shield and sure defender. My stronghold. I shall call to the Lord, to whom all praise is due, then I shall be made safe from my enemies. Abba, Holy Father, you are our rock, our foundation, our fortress. You, who are truly remarkable beyond words can describe, so intimate, yet so transcendent. You, who are so close to each of us as we allow you to be, at the Last Supper, your son assured us that you and his love for each of us, that you and he will care for each of us. It is only through our being with you, being here today with you, that we can begin to grasp the depth of your love for each of us. 
Will you now join me in the recall, which is printed in your bulletin? It is necessary for us as Christians to prayer every day, to study some portion of the scriptures each day, seeking in grace and praise to discover God's will for our own lives on a daily basis. As part of our discipleship, we also work to increase our love for one another. We move earnestly toward tithing to our church that the kingdom may increase its resources. For the same reason, we try to tithe our time and our conversation. Finally, we hope that our faith and love and discipline will increase until it flows beyond our fellowship and become a blessing to others. Do we have any children present with us today? Good morning. How are you? Good. Okay. When you ride in the car, do you read the signs along the road that tell you how far it is to the next town? Sometimes, sometimes the signs may say, Los Angeles, 43 miles, or Las Vegas, 271 miles. Those kinds of signs are nice because they let you know how far you have to go. But the signs I like to read are the ones that tell me how close I am to the beach one mile. <laughs> to me, this means I'm very close to home. It will only be a minute or so until I'm in my hometown. It is good to get home. That is where I eat the best, sleep the best, and play the best. I like home and I like to be close to it when I'm not there. We all like to get back home, for it makes us feel good. I guess the only sign that could make me feel better than the one I have just shown you is the one that reads Kingdom of God very close. How would this make you feel? Happy? That would mean that you were very close to heaven, wouldn't it? It sure would. If we see a sign that says kingdom of God only one mile away, it would mean that we've understood a lot of things that Jesus has taught us and that we have believed in him. It would also mean that we are soon to see Jesus, his father, and all of the other believers. It would be a wonderful feeling, wouldn't it? It would be better than any homecoming that we ever knew because this is what we pray for every day of our lives. A long time ago, a very religious man asked Jesus a lot of questions, and Jesus answered them. Jesus also asked him a question, and that same man answered it in the way that Jesus wanted him to answer it. When he told Jesus the answer, Jesus said that he was very close to the kingdom of God. He now only knew the answer, but he also believed in the answer that he gave. You and I are very close to the kingdom of God. It is only a little while until we see it, even though we are living in it right now. You may see some road signs that tell you you are very close to home. Beach, one mile. Means a lot to me and to you. But the sign of all will be the one that tells us we are soon to be with God our Father and his son Jesus Christ. This will be quite one day, one that will tell us one will tell us that all of us will enjoy more than any other. Okay, so we'll say a little prayer. All right. Dear God, thank you for this morning together. The kingdom of God is here among us right now, today, in this sanctuary. We thank you for the blessing of Jesus who taught us so much. Thank you for Juliana and her beautiful children's sermon. And um, just help us to remember this week that the kingdom is among us and that you are very near and we are close. In fact, we are home. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Juliana and Kathy, very much. 
And now for our tithes and offerings.
We have three passages today. The first is from John 14, verses 15 and 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. They who have, they who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The second passage is from Mark 12, 28 to 31. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And finally, from 1st John, that's first letter of John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 19. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us all of his spirit and we have seen and so testify that the father has sent his son as the savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he loved us first. Hope for all who are hopeful. 
As I was reflecting on the sermon, I also recalled we have a had a tradition, hopefully we will pick it up again next summer, of members sharing their faith journeys. And so my faith journey is going to be intertwined within this sermon. I first came to Community Church in 1992 when her daughter was a junior in high school and was looking for a youth group, and she had a number of friends who were members of the youth group at Community Church at that time. And so she started coming, and I didn't want her to go alone, so I started to attend. And I've been here ever since. In 1996, 1997, uh, an important person in this church, or to this church, Bruce Van Blair, was called. And in 2000, during an Easter sunrise service, and I don't know if any of you were there, but he gave a sermon regarding a base sticker, which struck home with me. A base sticker came, it was a term that Bruce and his friends used to describe in a game of hide and seek, and we all played hide and seek. That person who basically just was out of the way a bit, close enough to hit home without being caught, but not enough, didn't risk enough to make it adventuresome and make it fun for everybody else. So they called that person a base sticker. That had, it was a way to describe my journey with God these past years. In 2005, I also gave a sermon related to base sticking. 2010, I gave a sermon related to base sticking. <laughs> you detect a pattern. <laughs> However, more recently, this year in fact, with Bruce's February 18th sermon calling a different God and Mary's April 15th sermon Love makes us God's children. My focus began to change. My focus began to look at God's agape love. Now we need a little foundation. And this helped me work through the sermon, and it may be helpful to you. By God, who do you mean God? To me, God is that transcendent living force which created the universe, our world, you and me, and which knows each of us intimately and is providing us guidance daily, as we just affirmed in our recall. So I ask you, do you believe in God? If so, is that God a loving God? Or is it the judgmental God of the Old Testament? More on that later. The next question, after the God question, is who for you is Jesus? Is he truly the Son of God? That's for each of you to decide. And the freedom of community church is that we allow each of you to decide. We don't tell you what to believe. We come together 
to learn together, to develop our own theology together, to determine for ourselves who is God, who is Jesus. In our small groups, that's what's discussed as we study scripture. But that's the beauty about community church for me. Going back to the scripture, particularly the synaptic gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Matthew 3.17, and this is the time of Jesus' baptism by John in the Jordan River. As many of you know, a dove came upon Jesus. And in Matthew 3.17, the Spirit said, This is my beloved Son in whom I take delight. In Mark 1.13, a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son in whom I take delight. In Luke 4.22, And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and there came a voice from heaven, You are my beloved son in whom I delight. Then we look at the fourth gospel, John 1, 32 to 34. John the Baptist testified again. I saw the spirit come down from heaven like a dove and come to rest on him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize in water had told me. The man, that is Jesus, on whom you see the Spirit, came down and rested on the one who is to baptize in the Holy Spirit. I have seen it and have borne witness. This is God's chosen one. And finally, we turn to Paul. In Romans 1, 2 to 6, the gospel God announced beforehand in sacred scriptures through his prophets. It is about his son. On the human level, he was a descendant of David, but on the level of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he was proclaimed Son of God by an act of power that raised him from the dead. It is about Jesus, our Lord. Through him, I received the privilege of an apostolic commission to bring people of all nations to faith and obedience in his name, including you who have heard the call and belong to Jesus Christ. Where does that leave us? Where does that leave me? We have it from three independent sources, the Synoptic Gospels, the Book of John, and Paul's letter to Romans, that Jesus is the chosen one, his son, our Lord, as well as being king, which in fact got him killed, crucified. And then we have Bruce Van Blair from his February 18th sermon. Who is the best and clearest champion of of the grace and mercy, and love, and forgiveness of God in the entire New Testament. Well, Jesus, of course. So next to Jesus, who is the greatest champion of grace, and mercy, and love, and forgiveness of God in the New Testament? Hands down, it is Saul of Tarsus and the Apostle Paul, who gave us his words from Romans. And finally, there's a well-known New Testament scholar who I've been reading of late, N.T. Wright. Some of you may be familiar with him. And from his commentary on Paul, he raises these questions. The challenge for today's Christian is to ask, what does it mean to recognize and submit to the authority of Jesus himself? What does it mean to call him Lord and live by that? There is nothing in the New Testament to suggest that faith is a general awareness of a supernatural dimension or general trust in the goodness of some distant divinity so that some may arrive at this Jesus and others by different route. Faith in Christian terms means believing precisely that the living God has his entrusted his authority to Jesus himself, who is now exercising it for the salvation of the world. Entrusting his authority to Jesus at the time he was baptized. 
Can I honestly accept that God has entrusted his authority to Jesus so I can recognize Jesus as Lord? If Jesus is Lord, can I ignore his commandments without consequences? In this regard, I often think of Jesus' encounter with that Roman centurion from Matthew 8, 9 to 10. As the centurion says, I know for my, I myself am under orders with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come here, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Jesus heard him with astonishment and said to the people who were following him, Truly I tell you, nowhere in Israel have I found such faith. Now, going to Apostle John. There's a very strong argument that the author author of the book of John and the first letter, or first epistle, 1 John, was John the Apostle, one of the 12 disciples. What does this mean for us? It means that the author, author of John and the first epistle were there, was there. He was there when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. He was there when Jesus told his followers the parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the prodigal son, as well as the other parables. And he was there in the upper room the night before Jesus' crucifixion. In terms of chronology, all this happened in a three to four year period from 27 to 30 AD during Jesus' ministry. Paul's letters were written between 48 and 57 A.D., and Paul died somewhere between 64 and 66 A.D. There was a brutal war between the Jews and the Romans when they destroyed Jerusalem, leveled it to the ground, and that occurred somewhere between 66 and 70 A.D. The book of John and the first letter of John were written somewhere between 85 and 95 A.D. Before that Roman-Jewish war, John lived in Jerusalem and was one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church together with James and Peter. Sometime before the war and because of the tension with Rome, John left with other Christians for the city of Ephesus. And possibly made a stop on the island of Patmos, where the book of Revelations was believed written. At the time John left Jerusalem, he was somewhere between 50 and 60 years old. And during that time, since the crucifixion, 20 to 30 years, John was in Valley reflecting on Jesus' teaching and discussing those teachings with Jesus' early disciples in Jerusalem, reflecting on Jesus' message of agape love. Then somewhere between 85 A.D. and 95 A.G., John wrote or dictated to a scribe the book of John and the first letter when John was somewhere between 80 and 90 years old. By the time the gospel of John and first letter were written, John understood the essence of God and the essence of Jesus. Love. Simple, agape love. Tradition also tells us that John was no longer able to walk and had to be carried on a stretcher, but that he created so much love, again, agape love, that he changed the energy of the room. The same is often said of St. Francis and Mother Teresa. Okay, so now we have, we have this word love. And I'm sure all you know the difference in the three Greek words for love, or possibly four, but this focus focus on three Greek words. But it's important to keep that in mind when you hear these passages where they refer to love. Since the books and the letters of the New Testament were initially written in Greek, we must understand the three definitions. 
First, there's eros love, which is what we often call romantic love, passionate love, with sensual desire and longing. Then there's philo, which refers to loyalty to friends, family, and community, requires virtue, equality, and familiarity. Then we have agape, or Christian love, or compassionate love. Agape love does not refer to the emotional state we often associate with love, but means acting for the good of another. In the King James Version of the Bible, it is simply translated as charity. C.S. Lewis uses the word to describe a selfless love, a love that was passionately committed to the well-being of the other, or to actively promote another person's good. To actively promote another person's good. Finally, it was used by early Christians to refer to the self-sacrificing love of God for humanity. A great description of agape love, one that we are all familiar with because inevitably this passage is read at weddings, is found in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. Love is patient and kind. Love envies no one. Is never boastful, never conceited, never rude. Love is never selfish, never quick to take offense. Love keeps no score of wrongs, takes no pleasure in the sins of others, but delights in the trust. There is nothing love cannot face. There is no limit to its faith, its hope, its endurance. So next time you hear that passage, think agape love. With that background, turning to our first gospel reading today, remember that this is the Apostle John, the elder Apostle John, Apostle John recalling what happened at the Last Supper. And when you hear love, think again. In that upper room, before he was crucified, Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Anyone who has received my commandments and obeys them, he, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. Again, talking about agape love. In our second gospel reading from Mark 12, 28 to 31, when the scribe asked, which is the first of all the commandments? And Jesus answered, the first, which is actually taken from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one Lord, and you must love agape love, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And second is this. You must love thy neighbor as thyself. From Leviticus 19.18. No other commandment is greater than these. These same two commandments can also be found in Luke and in Matthew. And finally from Matthew, Jesus says, Everything in the law and prophets hangs on these two commandments. These are foundational commandments. And you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? When Jesus asked the lawyer, after responding to the lawyer with the above two commandments and the parable, which of these three, the priest, the scribe, or the Samaritan, do you think was neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? He answered, the one who showed him kindness. Jesus said to him, go and do as he did. The operative words in both of these commandments is love, agape, selfless love. That is what we as Christians are commanded to do. So now let's take a little further look at our third passage. 
first letter of John. When I read, excuse me, when I read John's first letter again in full after Mary's April 15th sermon, in a preparation for a discussion of her sermon and the letter the next day with our men's group, I was simply blown away. Thinking that this letter was written by one of the original 12 disciples. After 60 years of reflecting on and living and embodying Jesus' message of agape love. My dear friends, let us love one another. Because the source of love is God. Anyone who loves it is a child of God and knows God, but the unloving know nothing of God, for God is love. Thus we have come to know and believe in the love which God has for us. God is love. Those who abide or dwell in love abide or dwell in God. And God abides or dwells in them. In love there is no room for fear. Indeed, perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and anyone who is afraid has not attained to love in its perfection. We love because God loved us first. When you think about Apostle John's letter in conjunction with Paul's description of agape love, I ask again, who is your God? Is your God the loving God of John and the New Testament? Or is it the judgmental God? There was a speaker now deceased who I followed for years. You may have heard of him, Wayne Dyer. One of his popular quotes was, change the way you look at things and the things you look at change. I then thought after Mary's sermon, what if I looked at everything through agape eyes? What if I treated everyone with agape love? I try, but as my wife can attest, I'm not that consistent in that approach, but I continue to try and trying each day. Why? Because that is what God and Jesus commanded us to do. Excuse me, I'm going to sit down for a minute. I feel a little faint. What if we a community church practice agape love as to each other, to visitors and to neighbors? What would have happened had we practiced agape love toward each other during the big decisions over the past 20 years? The decisions may have been the same, but there would have been less acrimony, hurt feelings, and maybe a few former members may have stayed and remained part of our faith family. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to excuse myself. Alan, can you finish up, please, with the balance of the service? Thank you. 